Good evening. My name is Johanna Kolinen and you are watching Crosstalks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. Join us in discussing today's topics on Twitter, where our handle is Crosstalks TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. Human existence is to a large extent defined by the materials we use. We categorize parts of human history into periods like the Stone Age or the Bronze Age because ma the materials we are able to control, produce and shape also shape us in the process. Technological leaps throughout history correlate strongly with the discovery of new materials. Today, much of material science is done on a molecular and atomic level. Nanotechnology is already reshaping the world, but researchers are also finding new ways to evolve and enhance old materials, like wood. What new materials will enable technological leaps in the next few years? What aspects of materials are most interesting to researchers today? And in the urgent environmental crisis we are all battling right now, how can material science contribute to saving the world? Joining us in the studio to discuss these topics are Ulrika Edlund, Associate Professor in Polymer Technology at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Niklas Hedin, Professor at the Department of Materials and Environmental Chemistry, uh, Environmental Chemistry at Stockholm University, and Anna Delin, Professor in Computational Nanomagnetism at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome to Crosstalks. So, Ulrika, let's start with you. You work mm -hmm. with polymers, which mm -hmm. are, I am learning, large molecules. Right. Uh, and more specifically, you research ways to create sustainable, renewable and biodegradable uh, polymer materials. For laymen, I think we know about polymers mostly from plastics, but they also occur in nature and indeed our own biology. Um, and, and in your quest for polymers for new materials, you're looking to nature. Could you tell us a little bit about this? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the core concept is really to identify polymers synthesized by nature and that we could use as viable material resources. Uh, we are already processing a lot of biomass for food, for feed, for materials, but we're also in that process wasting a lot of biomass. Uh, and there are polymers hiding in there, polymers that we think could be good material resources and that ultimately we hope can replace at least some of all the polymers that we today use from fossil resources. I mean, the, the way to do it today is to take fossil oil or natural gas and put it through a refinery where you crack it into uh, a range of different small molecules and they are being processed as bulk chemicals or they are raw materials for making materials. And we really think of uh, biomass and whatever is produced in nature as something that can be converted to useful products in a biorefinery. So what we're trying to do is to fractionate biomass in the same way that we fractionate fossil oil and produce a lot of chemicals that could ultimately replace the fossil-based chemicals as bulk chemicals, as materials and also as fuels. Uh, that's very interesting and, and, and yes, and, and very urgent too, of course. Mm -hmm. This connects to what Nicholas is doing. Um, your main focus is, is also materials that are su sustainable or environmentally friendly. Uh, and in particular materials that can support technologies that help the environment. Uh, why is this important for you as a material scientist? Mm. So we have these grand challenges in, in, uh, in, in our society and, and sort of climate change is perhaps one of, one of the biggest and um, a lot of predictions uh, so, um, show, shows that um, we need to capture CO2 when we produce uh, electricity in the current um, global energy system. However, the materials used for capturing CO2 today costs a lot um, energy-wise. Basically, it will cost too much electricity to capture that CO2. And here there is a possibility, an example on why we are devoting our time to, to researching materials that could enhance such capture to a lower cost. And, and we, in my research group and in also in other research groups at Stockholm University, we focus on porous materials that can capture the CO2 because it has the potential to reduce the cost for CO2 capture at large power stations. I'm going to now ask a really childish question, which is how long does it stay once it's captured? So it should stay temporarily. Yeah. So, 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 it, 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 so, so, and the answer would be two minutes, roughly, give and take. 
So, we may so, need so more process, than two minutes. These, <laughs> so these processes <laughs> need to be cyclic. So, yeah. so, so, so CO2 needs to, to end up on the material for a while. And then it's going to be uh, recycled and recovered, this CO2, in a pure stream for storage, further storage uh, under Earth uh, in all the all the oil deposits, for example. Yeah. Uh, two minutes. Uh, Anna Delin, your field is uh, computational nanomagnetism. I'm going to ask about what some of the practical applications are, but could you also very briefly say what that is? Yes. Uh, so it's magnetism in, in very small structures. And actually, it's an everyday technology that you're using all the time. Uh, the most famous uh, uh, example that I know of is the giant a magneto resistive reed heads that are in, in hard disks. Um, that invention got the Nobel Prize in 2007. <coughs> and, and that's basically a uh, transport uh, that you, you, uh, you can, uh, uh, depending on if you have, a, um, depending on how the magnetism is in your, you have a, a, a layer, tri layer, so um, a nano system made of three layers like this. Mm -hmm. And depending on if you have the magnetism in parallel or in anti-parallel, you have uh, low resistance or high resistance. And this uh, makes a very sensitive sensor. <coughs> and this made it possible uh, to uh, store and read uh, and write uh, information uh, with a very much higher speed than, than before this invention. So this was a very uh, important revolution uh, for computer technology, actually. And Maybe most people think of silicon, that's computers, right? Mm -hmm. And electronics, but the magnetism part is very important. And especially when you go down, you need very small dimensions. So it's on the nano level that we want to be able to understand and manipulate the magnetism today. So then you're going to get a little childish question also from me, which is, uh, which is, uh, is, the, is magnetism operating differently on the nano level than than in the sort of everyday sense that we, that we know it from, from magnets in, in bigger chunks of material? Uh, yes, because you have more surface and you also get the quantum mechanical effects. You get something called quantum wells where the magnetism waves scatter because there are, it can feel the walls. So it behaves completely differently, yes. And you have to go to quantum mechanics to, to understand what's happening. That's super exciting. Um, so, uh, Ulrika, one, one way that you explore uh, new possibilities is by looking for smaller molecules uh, in nature or in waste products, as we mentioned, that, that can be combined into polymers. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about, more about what that, what that is? Yeah, well, usually uh, when we make polymers from fossil-based resources, that's exactly what we do. We have the small molecules that are being produced by oil cracking. We have synthetic methods in which we covalently link them together, and we have the macromolecules constituting the plastics to rubbers and all the other polymeric materials. And what we're looking now is to replace at least some of these monomers, the building blocks, with the small molecules that are produced by nature. Uh, either in, in the pristine state or as a byproduct of processing the biomass. Maybe in a food production, you're processing straw or a cereal straw, and then you have uh, also residues in the, in the form of sh uh, stems or leaves, and maybe you can crack them somehow and get small molecules, and we can use them as the building blocks instead. I know, Nicholas, that your group has uh, developed a way to use horse manure yep. to extract magnetically acti active coal. Is, is the process anything like what we just heard about? I think it's sort of funny because it relates to both sort of Ulrika and Anna's work in some sense. Uh, uh, yeah, it does. Uh, so, so, so it's... Uh, well, uh, there's a possibility to utilize um, bio-waste um, for production of, of functional materials. And we, ha we set out um, an activity relating to the CO2 capture, um, producing so-called activated carbons. Uh, and we looked uh, into um, large potential streams of bio waste that could be used. And horse manure was one of those. And in large potential streams of bio waste means 
for for, yes. for because if one would have to have this sort of CO2 capture at power mm. plants, it's going to be large amounts of, of um, material that it has to be used. So if one can have a sustainable approach to, to producing those materials, that could be consistent. So that yes. we, we set out to do that. And horse manure was one of those. Horses <laughs> poop a lot is yeah, what you so just said with many yeah, big words. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. Yes, yeah? is yeah? that is the shit or what to call it? But any anyhow, so so we went to that um, by waste then. Mm. Uh, and we processed it, processed it in, in an initial stage with adding an iron catalyst, uh, iron, an iron salt, uh, and we treated that first uh, at a lower temperature, and then we activated it further at a higher temperature in a flow of CO2. And during that process, uh, we appeared to have uh, formed, uh, say, around 20 nanometer sized embedded iron oxide nanoparticles inside our uh, from biomass produced uh, activated carbon. And it is magnetic in the sense that it can be removed with an external magnet. Hmm. Uh, but it's not magnetic in the sense that it, it has a permanent magnetism thereafter. So it's magnetic, uh, but it releases its magnetism after the field is removed. You say we appeared to have, I mean, you weren't trying for this, or, or, or were you trying for this? This is an example that, that uh, serendipity. We were initially planning to, to produce a, an, a good CO2 sorbent without magnetism, but we ended up with this well um, embedded uh, nanoparticles of, of iron oxide, and I'm sort of proud that we realized it. You know, we, we, we came to the point where we tested the magnetism. Uh, for some reasons. Why? Uh, Why did you test the magnetism? It, it seems very surprising to me. Uh, or is it just that... we that had, okay, it, was a, it was an inference. We had some uh, other experiments that, that, that was difficult to perform. Mm. And for, because those were difficult to perform, we got an indication that something might, might be uh, particular with this uh, material in the sense of magnetism. And then we tried. This, this connects all very nicely, because I know, Anna, that, that you've been thinking a lot about serendipity in, in mm. research, but I didn't realize it's this practical. It's very practical, and actually yeah. it occurs in experimental... Uh, so I'm a theoretician or computational mm. physicist, but it's the experimental uh, uh, people who, who mm. see it in practice. Mm. So, um, yeah, my thinking of it is that... So in material science, you have so many combinations. There's literally trillions of possible combinations that you can try out. So if, we, if I start here from my understanding and, and, and sort of try to find something smart, I might find something. But, but maybe it's a good idea to move to a completely different possibility space over here by just mixing up some completely new combination and treating it in a different way in the lab and or maybe do a, another measurement than you're mm. usually doing. And suddenly you find something unexpected and that will give you new insights uh, that you couldn't have had if you had s continued here, you know, from all your smartness that you already had. So, so um, that's my take on the serendipity. At the same time, I mean, I, I understand this, but at the same time, uh, if you say there are literally trillions of options, you mean the potential combinations of all materials in the yeah. world? Yes, but then... Then it seems to, to go out and just try some things at random seems like, like we imagine science as kids, but not so much as, as how it's actually done. Well, it's, uh, Do you really it, get to just randomly try seems, things in labs? Uh, uh, it seems that people do it anyway, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, a machine breaks down or yeah. um, a PhD student misunderstands the instructions. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, in computational physics, we're trying to do this systematically. So it's not supposed to be systematic, so, but then you can turn it around and say, OK, so we have this vast space of possibilities. What are we going to do? And it turns out that uh, the computational power has increased so much that we can start uh, uh, searching the space. Um, either you can just uh, uh, calculate all the combinations that we know and have a database, uh, of a lot of properties, that uh, all the properties that we can calculate. Uh, or you could also try to have something called genetic algorithms, where you try to, um, uh, through some rules, you say, I want a band gap, which is this, I want a semiconductor, which uh, has this and this property. And then you sort of try to 
go there with some random, half-random algorithm. Um, uh, so this is what's happening in computational material science right now, that we're trying to do the serendipity in a systematic way, if you but want how to say. I mean, in general, I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong, but now I'm just guessing, but I would guess that, that if you're in material science, you're probably se specialized in specific materials or specific types of, of materials, and then you're exploring that sort of deeper and deeper around it somehow. But the pr problems in the real world, challenges that need solving, mm. tend to be of a very sort of specific, well, specific nature, but very unclear. The, how does, how does the, the material science research meet the real world? Is there any, ever a gap between, I mean, maybe you're talking to the horse manure carbon people over here, but actually mm. you should be speaking to the polymer people over here because they may have, or maybe they may have the solution to my to each other. <laughs> <laughs> how much do you speak to each other? I mean, how does, how does this work? No. I'm, 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 I'm seriously asking, asking the question, is there a gap or is, it, is there just an infrastructure where all of the answers eventually always find their, the solutions? What would you say? Yeah. But I think we, we could always talk more, obviously, because there's so much to learn from stepping maybe out of your comfort zone and realizing that there's a different perspective than mine. Mm. on whatever. And I think that also relates to this serendipity, which is sometimes related to us, that discovery by coincidence. Mm. And, I, and I think that there's quite a small element of coincidence in there and a lot of element of just being able to reflect on what you see. And as you say, you were proud of realizing mm. because uh, anyone can make something by co coincidence, but understanding the reason and understanding what is really going on, that is what makes a person a scientist. And definitely something that makes you able to benefit from it and, and maybe turn it into to a good concept. I think since you're all in fields w with clearly practical mm. applications, I'm assuming that this whole tendency for research to, to having to be productive and be measured in different ways uh, must affect you very strongly. I mean, in some ways it's easier because, because your work actually does have results. And, but on the other hand, uh, you'd also be pressured to do that. Do, do you feel that there is enough space to, to be thorough like that and to reflect and to take the time to look at the thing that's, that's strange? Or does that have to come out of the individual scientist's sort of passion and spare time? Anna? Mm. Uh, I think it's very enriching, actually, uh, that uh, the basic research that... I can see that my basic research can, have, can be quite close to to real applications, real use in society. Um, it also gives a, a direction, so I'm quite happy with that. Mm. Um, Nicholas, what do you think? Yeah, the, uh, for me, the sort of div division in between sort of uh, mm, science that would, would appear and be done without any connection to something else is, uh, it's, it's strange in a way. So, 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 but of course, our methodologies demands that we take the time, uh, and uh, this this speed, uh, and perhaps then productivity that we have could, is perhaps could be has to be held down a little bit for mm. us to explore uh, the complexity that we are working with. Um, but that's for me more a question about sort of. Uh, thoroughness and, and uh, be allowed not to rush too much. Mm. Uh, we yeah. have a Skype guest, I think, yes, joining us from Zurich, Switzerland. Mm. Hasib Ahmed uh, is an artist who has exhibited around the world and has done a lot of work where he experiments with different uh, materials. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Uh, Hasib, you call yourself a research-based artist. What on earth is that? Uh, well, just uh, quickly, I would like to say I'm actually in, in Brussels at the von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics right now. It's a little bit of a change in my itinerary, but uh, which, I'll, which I'll address a little bit later. Um, I, th I think what's important about uh, research-based artists to realize is that artists have always done research, even traditionally. Um, but uh, research-based art, as it's been come to be known in the last 15 years or so, um, is a kind of practice where the artist is more focused on a process or a way of working 
um, developing a methodology of working as opposed to producing a, uh, an object itself. Um, so, so an object that a research-based artist would produce is something like uh, that's part of a longer paper trail. Um, and the artwork often doesn't necessarily in, in, enclose all of the works. Um, for that reason, I think research-based artists are also um, often working inside of institutions as opposed to commercial galleries. Um, and, and also working across different disciplines and territories that are not normally considered or, uh, part, of, part of the art world or terrain of the art. So, for example, for me, for this reason, I'm also uh, pursuing a PhD in practice-based arts right now because this allows me access to the high-level research in different disciplines that I want to work with, um, which we'll talk about, I imagine. Um, in the in the last years, you've been doing art and research around topics like scale models and wind tunnels at the University of the Arts uh, in Zurich. Uh, scale models and wind tunnels sounds very practical. It sounds like it involves building and materials. Uh, is that correct? Um, yeah, for the last uh, two years, I've been working with the Size Matters Research Group at the ZHDKA in Zurich, and um, for us, it's it was very important in a way to find a uh, a way to produce artworks with the uh, materials and, and uh, instruments that are actually shaping the world itself. So everything that moves always has to move through the threshold of a wind tunnel before it can uh, enter the industrially produced world. And um, whereas traditional artworks are normally sort of representing or describing those things, we actually wanted to interfere or work with the, with the streamlining of the world itself. Um, so, you know, uh, that's that's what we've been doing for the last two years and using the wind tunnel as a site to produce artworks. Uh, another earlier work is called Fishbone Chapel. And if I understand this correctly, you created structures based on forms from zebrafish embryos. Um, and this work took nine months to build from the scanning of the fish embryo to the 3D printing of the finished artwork. Um, can you elucidate just a little more about? I understand that you're saying that the that a big part of the of the work is the process, uh, but can you talk a little bit about what the stages of that process? It what are you learning or finding out in this research, so to speak? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. Uh, when I was working with uh, I was working with the Netherlands uh, Toxico Genomics Center for this project, and what I realized is that. Um, a lot of genomics research is conducted on zebrafish because for the first four days of their life, by law, it's technically not considered alive because of the way their biology works, because they're eating uh, actually their, uh, the yolk from their embryos as they, they grow into adulthood. So during this time, all kinds of, research, uh, all kinds of uh, biological research can be conducted on them. And um, uh, I wanted to kind of address this uh, idea of uh, biotechnological research producing a new kind of stage between living and dead. And for this reason, I kind of incorporated it with uh, bone chapels, which were traditionally, you find them throughout Italy and France as well, uh, place uh, uh, kind of chapels made from the bones of humans as a kind of momentum mori or a reminder of the temporality of life. And so I tried to to bring these two things together. And uh, the way that this happened was I had to go through a long process of, of working with the um, uh, geneticists, getting uh, the embryos, having them CT scanned, putting them into the computer, and then scaled up and brought uh, uh, into the world with using 3D printers at the scale of the human body, because inevitably the zebrafish is supposed to approximate what happens in the human body, um, and uh, so, and I, then I use traditional methods like plaster and stucco to kind of approximate uh, again, bring together the high tech and, and the traditional um, use of materials. I think um, this is fascinating, and that sounds very beautiful. Because when I read it, I have to say I I didn't get it at all, and when you explained it, it makes perfect sense to me. Uh, what do you guys say? Does what are you thinking when you're when you're listening uh, to this, Nicholas? Um, I think there is a lot of aesthetics in the in the in the, f in the forms and materials that that are produced by biological matter. But I'm thinking associating to to a Haseb here. Uh, I'm thinking about the um, glass um, castles that our diatoms lives in. So they they sort of swim around in these sort of very beautiful castles of glass and lives in them. And so on. So that's how I reflected on on Haseb. Yeah. 
Mm. I think it's fascinating as well. I mean, it's just a different perspective on materials, but I think also that maybe material science as such is that kind of area of science where it's doable because it's tangible in a sense. We mm. can we can understand materials through many different senses. I mean, our uh, ca characterization techniques is just one way of understanding the material, but there's also the the visual effect, the sense of touching it, the topography. There's a lot of elements in the materials that maybe we don't address mm. on an everyday basis in our research that definitely comes into play when you want to turn a material into a viable product. I mean, uh, for you as a customer, what uh, does it feel like to touch the product? That's not the kind of issues that we focus mm. on in, in material development, but it maybe make a huge difference to you when you use the product. So maybe we have to broaden our perspectives a little bit when it comes to understanding materials. Mm. Anna? Well, I heard more of an uh, ethical question being asked. So what about these zebra fish, you know, that they're not alive and they're not dead? I mean, that's something that we are making up uh, for our own convenience. It does ask probably. some, it does, because then you're saying, well, the zebra fish aren't, aren't alive, so they're just a biological material like any other. And that does raise some, some worrying questions down well, the line. Yeah, I, I don't find it very convincing. No? No? <laughs> no. Yeah, I've never heard I mean, of this. Maybe I'm gonna we have should to be more honest that it's actually something alive. So. Yeah. But I mean, then, so ourselves. I mean, we... <laughs> so yes. It, yeah. it, it's an interesting, it is an interesting question. But I think you're all touching on something here that is, uh, I mean, I would assume that in material science, uh, as science in general, we're, we are very um, interested in utility and function. Uh, but what immediately happened here also in this conversation is to say, well, of course, materials have um, symbolic or, or metaphorical Im importance or meanings also that are also real in, in a very practical sense. Of course, the quality, like how it feels, is also an important, an important quality of, of the material. Uh, I, I wonder, should, does it make you question how we're organizing the teachings of this, these topics? Uh, does it does it make you question your own work at all? Uh, this this way of thinking, Nicholas. Yeah, in a way it does. Sort of the sort of um, maybe one can sort of phrase it in the sort of um, top down, bottom up approach. We 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 have very much a bottom up approach built up, um, and and when it comes to materials, why not sort of top down too? Sort of. Yeah, and, and uh, that's not reflected really in our curri curriculum at this moment, but maybe in 10 years. Hasib, what happens? I mean, you collaborate with researchers, and I, I do understand, I, I think, what, what your work gets from the science, but what do you think the scientists receive from working with an artist? Well, um, I think it often takes a special kind of scientist <laughs> who wants to work with an artist. Um, but I, I think that what hap happens is that um, the reason why certain scientists would find it interesting is that more and more different scientists find their uh, research and their work uh, being narrowed down or turned into a field of expertise as a field of open research. So they're being asked, especially in engineering fields, to just simply uh, supply knowledge to industry as opposed to kind of an open inquiry which which allows for a certain kind of in, uh, freedom of knowledge. And, uh, and when they see an artist in an artistic practice where all of those questions are open questions, it also for them opens up their own territory when they're working and, and working then together with me. Um, and I also think that there is something traditional, uh, you know, traditionally like you could say uh, art for art's sake is a kind of traditional saying. And th these days that kind of allows for the irrelevance of, of artworks to kind of be a sense of decadence, but at the same time, this kind of uselessness of the artwork has a kind of uh, opens up a kind of possibility that maybe there isn't necessarily a direct usefulness to uh, an object that's produced through an inquiry. That that maybe it can be left open for a little bit longer to to pose questions and sit as a kind of uncomfortable object at the border at the borders of disciplines and at the border of sci a highly specialized scientific inquiry and the rest of society. Um, 
So I think that's the benefit between mm. this kind of collaboration. Nicholas, you weren't mentioning before, we were, well, actually all of us were talking about this fact, the, the material science uh, draws from basic research, but is really close to the, to the finished products and, and yeah. the industry applications. Do you recognize this pressure uh, that Asif is, is describing, that you, in a way you just become a knowledge no, I, I would I wouldn't, not personally, I, mm. I, I don't, uh, uh, I personally enjoy the, the sort of... Uh, fact that what what I do is quite interlinked with uh, sort of potential needs in the society and the sort of everyday needs and I I can still appreciate that 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 others might want to explore the freedom and, and maybe also in the form of art and, and, and sort of the sort of more sort of less mundane <laughs> um, but I don't feel that. I don't feel that pressure. Are but that, that's a cook maybe inside of me then. Are there materials that are, are there, are there areas that are unfashionable to research? Uh, are, are, there, are there types of materials? Are there trends in this where you sure. would say, okay, right now this is, no, you're all nodding. Yeah. I know what I'm thinking. Because I mean, then, then kind of uh, re demanding that, well, no, but well, I'm only interested in this thing. And then you, if you research the unfashionable thing in a way that comes in cycles. Like yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That would make you more of, a, of an artist uh, in, in some sense if you demand to get to, to research mm. the unfashionable thing. But I guess maybe funding doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. No, it does not. <laughs> no? Uh, I, how do you guys feel about, about, about the relationship to the real world? When you, when you are in your office doing the actual research or in your laboratory, is the real world present? Is the ultimate application present in, in your mind and in your day and in your work? Uh, very much so, I would say. And, and I have to agree with Nicholas. I find it really rewarding to work with uh, something that is quite close to an application state, that you have some goals or, or you, you have a, a tangible idea of what you want to achieve. Uh, it makes you much more able to focus on function of the material. You know about the challenges you face, you, you, you know about what, what kind of um, properties that are being demanded for it to actually work in a real product, a real application. I think it's really important to do have a connection with the real world. It's going to be used somewhere. The material has to function, otherwise no one will be interested in ever implementing it. So, so understanding the challenges that the material is going to meet outside my laboratories is crucial to the task, I would say. What kinds of, of uh, properties then are in demand right now uh, of materials? If we, if we think that there are these sort of general trends of we need, well, we need things to be sustainable, obviously, That's, that would be like a base, base level requirement for everything we do as a civilization right now. But more specifically, are there other things that, are, that we're currently searching for? Or what are the ongoing quests? As I have to say now and always, function would be priority number one. I mean, you have to deliver something that works. That, that's priority number one. And uh, it cannot be set in generally what, what we need. It's going to be, ha we have to, to, I think, optimize each and every application by itself because there are so many different product properties and profiles that we need. But I would say function. Nicholas, yeah. no? Yeah, um, second that sort of function to what, what uh, and of course then function is um, relating quite much to, to um, the overall uh, um, system related uh, aspects we have. I can give one example on, on sort of someone called me recently and wanted a functional material that could transform uh, uh, hydrogen to methane from the spare power from windmills. That is a typical uh, function that is needed today to uh, have, have uh, uh, to utilize that, that excess power that is around there to transform that to something that can carry energy and methane is such a molecule. Uh, and that is an example on, on things that is uh, in demand at the moment. 
And of course, I would assume, I'm realizing as you're saying this, that of course, any, anything relating to energy efficiency yeah. as a subset of sustainability, anything that isn't too expensive to produce and mm. that is, isn't too expensive to use either yeah. uh, is, is there. I have uh, this feeling that uh, inevitably, it seems from reading the newspapers, that we will have to change many of the materials that we use, that in, in a, let's say, 50 to 100, on a 50 to 100 year scale, mm. much of the physical environment, it might look the same, but, but it's going to be built in very, very different ways. Do you guys feel that you're part of a revolution right now? Do you, are, do, do you, is there a feeling in the material sciences world that, that you're literally building, building the future? It's Anna? a slow revolution, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, <laughs> I think we are... Uh, as humans, we, we tend to focus on the fast uh, changes. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a slow revolution, so I don't feel that in my everyday life. You're all looking a little bit surprised uh, at the question. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you exactly. you know you're it's saving like the world? For us, it's, a everyday <laughs> it's the everyday business. <laughs> Yeah, but but there is some. I know uh, that there's been another, for instance, that, that you've, you've been very worried about. Um, Let's just say that the long-term thinking around new materials hasn't always been fantastic. And the, there are some lessons that we should learn from this, and perhaps especially now when we're working with nanomaterials. Can you walk us through that set of thinking a little bit? Yeah, so that so I don't sound too yeah, techno-optimistic. Um, um, well, this is kind of kicking up an open door, mm -hmm. because now I think this is very well recognized that we, uh, we should test new materials for toxicity and life cycle and behavior and how we are going to recycle them before we actually start to use them on a broad scale. <coughs> but there have been, there's a lot of examples from the Just give from us a few past. examples, just to so remind. The most, the most famous example is DDT. Mm. Um, and that invention was actually awarded a Nobel Prize at some point in the 40s, I think. Yeah. And uh, so this was then considered to be the solution to all problems of, of uh, insects, insect problems, so um, especially um, malaria mosquitoes. So now we had the solution. We would eradicate malaria. That didn't happen. What instead happened was that um, uh, birds could not pro uh, procreate because the eggshells became too thin. <clears throat> and then one understood that this fat-soluble uh, poison uh, was slowly poisoning the whole ecosystem. Um, yes, and there are actually many more examples like that. Um, so one needs to, to take care uh, before starting to use new materials uh, on but a large scale. But this one is a very good example for... In well, one of many good examples of, of the, the time being a factor here, that the way it traveled through the ecosystem, it took decades to understand the gravity of the problem. <coughs> are we really... I'm not going to say don't invent new stuff, because I do want you to save yeah. the world, but, but are, are, you, are, we, are you serious enough? Are your colleagues serious enough about what you are unleashing on the world? Do you think? Mm. Or is, there a, is it built into everything you do, thinking about this, these long-term consequences as well? Niklas? Yeah, uh, I think we have such a, <coughs> such an awareness today uh, for that. Uh, our, but I do want to ask, answer another question. Basically, okay. we've been thinking about the uh, the global population. Then, uh, that one one thing is the new materials. Another one is the sheer mass of humans uh, and sort of and to to how we should reach uh, sustainable. Uh, materials utilization for the future, that is a challenge I can see. Mm. Because we are using, ev even if we're using all the materials, we are using massive amounts of them. And that I see as a challenge that I'm not sure that we have any good solution towards. I think we're not even clear yeah. at every point what we mean by sustainability. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge concept. Is a sustainable material something that is renewable or degradable mm. or recyclable or all of the above? Yeah. And, and I mean, there's no clear answer to that. I think we have to evaluate what is really sustainable in, in every new context. I mean, what about this product is going to be used here or mm. that application? Because sustainability is not just one thing. 
And, and that is really a key question yeah. for all of us to dig into. Hasib, you're nodding. What are you thinking? No, I mean, I, I, I would agree with the, with the question, the idea of sustainability. Um, I mean, there's, there's different concepts out there related to like zero consumption or, or um, different ideas like this. But I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a really valid question. Like why, why produce more when you don't know necessarily what the results or the effects are going to be? Um, and I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very difficult to tell, you know, like if, for example, I was at a talk last night here in Brussels and they were saying the the lecturer was saying that in 20 years, the, um, it, that there will be a complete collapse of global economy because uh, petrochemical uh, production will uh, kind of come to a halt and so on. And if that's really the question, then then uh, if that's a reality, then then no other question necessarily matters. Then that's the only question on the table. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but at the same time, it's like um, a lot of what we're talking about is like, well, how can we look at things from a different point of view as well? You know, how do we uh, um, maybe the problem is a kind of tunnel vision that each of us get within these particular disciplines. Um, so, yeah, it's a difficult. I, I, I do think, and did you say, you mentioned before that it, that is sort of a given now in your field that that of course you have to think about the lifetime impact of it. You have to you have to think about how it's going to slot into this new sort of circular economy. It's just that outside in in the actual in the capitalist system, indeed, of which we are all a part, mm. the idea of the circular economy is very ideological and, and considered to be quite sort of um, utopian and, and cutting edge. And, and I think there is a very interesting um, mm. glitch somehow between the scientific understanding that, of course, we're going to need to solve these problems and, and the, the inability of the rest of the world to get with the program mm -hmm. uh, somehow. Can you guys somehow contribute to a solution there or is it somebody else's job? How much is it, is it the material scientist's job to, to, to help, let's say, you know, commercial and political systems to change? Yeah, well, I think it's everybody's job and that's the thing. You cannot s ever solve such a huge and complex question just by one or two single approaches. Everyone really have to collaborate on that and do the different parts. And I mean, this is not just one question. It's really a collective thousand questions that we all have to contribute to solve. So we, we are doing our <laughs> small share. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... It's everybody uh, else who needs to step up a little bit. Yeah, I think we can all do more yeah. and maybe just realize that and to be humble to the task. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's a political policy question. You're saying that as though that means that it's okay. not your problem. Or uh, no, I, then it's, but I'm serious. Of course, you start with political policy mm. and that <coughs> governs I, <laughs> in an ideal world. Yeah, that in an ideal world, uh, politics would be governed, <laughs> would be informed track. at least by <laughs> science. But of course, that does not seem to be the case right mm. now entirely. Yeah, Niklas. Yeah, I think sort of that, that information flow exists, I think, from, from science to policymakers. But then comes sort of the hard questions how, how policymakers should sort of act on a global scale when we don't have institutions and taxes on a, on a global scale. There I can see, see uh, I would guess, a dilemma. Yeah. myself that, that if we have global questions and we we don't have a sort of a functional global sort of legislation i'm really. astonished to see that the hour is approaching an end and uh, we do need to have some questions from the audience uh, who are now promptly panicking but secretly you have been thinking about questions and the way this works is you raise your hand and then i point at you and then you get to walk over there and say your name and and state your question who has something on their mind yes please from the back row um, yeah, come over here to the to the podium, please. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. What is your name? Uh, my name is Mohammed. Hi. Uh, and I'm from Stockholm University. Welcome. What's your question? Uh, well, I think in more or less, in, there is always a question that comes up and. Uh, one of the common questions that always comes up is the control of the world population. Mm. And I rather disagree with what some people claim, like Bill Gates and 
and Mark Zuckerberg because they claim that and uh, as far as population is concerned, if it increases, then it's a threat to the living population. Mm -hmm. But the, the question is, and, uh, is science pro-life or anti-life? Because if science is pro-life as and everyone claims, then why should science fight and that people uh, reapproach or uh, reproduce and mm -hmm. become uh, larger? Because the aim of science is to facilitate, facilitate uh, an, an easier life for the population. Okay, that in itself may be a controversial uh, question, but that's very interesting. Yeah, and then, and then again, if science would be, well, I, uh, yes, we think we, we can agree that science is probably not anti-life. This is very interesting. Uh, how do you, first, I think, so let's see, this is maybe a two-part question. Uh, one is that is the aim of science to make life easier? And if so, does it follow uh, that, that, uh, that science shouldn't be involved with deciding, for instance, how big the, a population the world can carry? Who would like to start? Nicholas. Okay, so science, uh, a part of science, I think, is about uh, make, making life better. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, there are other aspects. Uh, there might be a built-in dilemma here. <coughs> Say that, that if we have, I'm not sure, but I think there might be a classical dilemma. If, if, if that is our part, a big part of our goal, to get a better life, we will increase also the consumption, the materials consumption, et cetera, et cetera. We get better life, but we have limited resources. So there might be a conflict in between a growing population with a lot of better life with limited resources. It could be, it could be a built-in dilemma. I don't know myself, but there's a possibility for a dilemma there. Mm -hmm. Anna, I, I think you're thinking something. What are you thinking? Yeah, one could run an utilitarian argument on this. So we maximize yeah. happiness in some way. And then, of course, if we have more yeah. people, if that's what counts, and more happy people, mm. then we're maximizing something. And it's the same argument that yeah. you had, but that uh, the resources are finite. Mm. We only have one Earth. Okay, we're trying to go to <laughs> Mars, but that's <laughs> far in, in the future to colonize Mars. So there's going to be some sort of optimum level there of, of population. But do I detect a little material science bias? Because I think I heard both of you imply that happiness is connected to the, to the consumption of more resources. It, it, we could also reconstruct how happiness is defined. It's not just materials. It's, uh, um, we could call it energy quality. People talk about exergy in this context. What's that? That's uh, energy of high quality. So basically the input to the Earth system is the radiation from the sun. Mm. And then uh, that's, uh, um, that's uh, uh, transformed into food for us through the ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, and that's basically how it works. And, and that, that, sort one, of puts that part the of it is non-negotiable. Non yeah, of and course, for exactly. Happiness. And yeah, that puts that. the limit to what we can take out of the system. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, Hasib, did you have something, something on this? Um, yeah, I, I think that it's re very difficult uh, because, of course, there's discussions about uh, population control and the population bomb, but I think that those are often uh, um, kind of putting the cart before the horse, mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, it really, it has a lot to do with... Um, there's a lot of latent kind of stereotypes that are built in into those kinds of assumptions or those kinds of statements oftentimes. Yeah. Um, because, for example, the areas which have higher levels of population growth are also areas which are the most impoverished as well um, and because they don't have high levels of education or also family planning or health infrastructure. So I think that those are the kinds of questions that need to be asked um, when somebody like Bill Gates or Zuckerberg or... Bef uh, the first person mm -hmm. to pose it would be Malthus, um, some hundreds of years ago. You know, would it, those those would be the underlying biases I think that need to be addressed in those types of questions, and, and then we can approach it from the uh, approach of systematics. I, I just think that it's a little that because of a lack of kind of social consciousness, mm -hmm. like larger political consciousness in society, as you were mentioning earlier. Uh, 
um, oftentimes scientists uh, and science is put in the position of producing progress inside of the world, you know, yeah. that science will save us. And, and I think that um, it's better maybe to take a step back from some of uh, and ask some of the underlying questions, I would yeah. say. Thank you. I'm realizing we're running out of time, and this is actually we've uh, cornered so many interesting things. Material science is perhaps ideological, and it is poetic, and all of these are are quite um, surprising results, uh, I think, for me. Certainly, food for thought. I would love to continue this discussion, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you to all my guests: Hasim Ahmed, Anna Delin, Ulrika Jedlund, and Niklas Hedin. Crosstalks will be back next month with more great minds and intelligent discussions. Be sure to check in at crosstalks.tv for updates on topics and guests. But for now, be safe and be brave.